Welcome to this week's edition of Outdoors Online, a weekly webcast produced by the North Dakota Game and Fish Department. I'm your host, Mike Anderson. Today we're going to start our first of a four-part series on our annual fishing previews. My first guest this week is South Central District Supervisor Paul Bailey. Paul, you manage the Missouri River from the Tail Race South. You also manage Lake Oahe and all the South Central District lakes. Let's focus first on Lake Oahe. Anglers are always interested in how many walleyes are out there and how big are they. Yeah, and on, on Lake Oahe, uh, abundance is very good right now. Again, our, uh, a lot of these fish are going to be on the, the smaller side with that good reproductive success we've had in recent years. But la we've been netting Lake Oahe or conducting our annual sampling surveys on there since 1968. And in 2018, we saw the fifth highest walleye abundance we've ever documented on Lake Oahe. So there's plenty of fish out there. Uh, their size structure, I guess, leaves a little bit to be desired right now. Uh, that's where we have... Uh, about 68% of the walleye in Lake Oahe are under 15 inches in size right now. Again, due to the good reproductive success we had in 2014, 15, and 16. 27% uh, of those fish are in that 15 to 20 inch range. And then 5% of those fish are over 20 inches. So there's, there's still good opportunity out there to you know, hook into some nice fish, uh, as anglers I think are well aware on the Missouri River in Lake Oahe. Okay, the big question is, Paul, should we be protecting those smaller walleyes? If those fish were uh, well fed and low in abundance, you know, so uh, that would be a, a case where we'd certainly consider a minimum length limit. One of the things we're seeing on Lake Oahe right now is those fish are so extraordinarily abundant that there's a few more of them out there than we really have groceries to sustain. So uh, anglers are probably noticing these smaller fish tend to be a little bit on the skinnier side, uh, whereas some of those larger walleye, say the you know 18 to you know up you know on, and on up fish. Uh, are a little more fat and happy. They've got better forage available to them. So right now, honestly, anglers shouldn't feel bad about harvesting some of these smaller fish. Uh, that'll actually be doing us somewhat of a favor on Lake Oahe. Uh, thin their numbers a little bit. There'll be more groceries to go around for the rest of those fish. And uh, hopefully they'll continue to grow and, and uh, grow into the, the more desirable sizes anglers like to see over the next few years. How about the Missouri River, Paul? Yeah, the Missouri River uh, system, we did see uh, good walleye reproductive success in 2014. Uh, but we didn't see quite as good a reproductive success in 15 and 16. So that did have an influence on the size structure. We're not dealing with quite as many of those, you know, 10 to say 14 inch fish as we are in Lake Oahe. On, in the Missouri River, we've got that strong 2014 year class. And a lot of those fish are now in that kind of 14 up to 16 inch range. So we did see a, a little better size structure on the Missouri River. Uh, about 44% of those fish are now into that 15 to 20 inch range. And then we still have that trophy potential out there as well on the Missouri River. Okay, so re reproduction's good. Absolutely, and that's a, on the Missouri River in Lake Oahe, uh, we are relying on natural reproduction of those walleye to maintain that fishery. Uh, the North Dakota Game and Fish Department hasn't stocked a walleye between Garrison Dam and the South Dakota border since 1981. So what we see out there is the result of natural reproduction and uh, they've been doing a, a bang up job. And in some cases, I'd say uh, in the last few years, maybe almost too good of a job because we've got uh, quite a few walleye out there. And uh, again, those smaller sizes aren't necessarily growing all that well. Right, so there's no plans to stock walleye in the Missouri River or Lake Oahe? Nope, not in the immediate future for sure. Any other regulation changes that we should be looking at? Uh, I mean, a question that uh, comes up pretty frequently on uh, when the Missouri River and Lake Oahe fishery, every spring, you know, we can have some pretty good fishing out there where sometimes some of those larger fish may be a little more vulnerable uh, to anglers. And uh, so a lot of anglers have certainly asked that question. It's a question we ask of ourselves every spring too is, would the Missouri River and Lake Oahe benefit from a, a more restrictive regulation, say like a one over 20 inch walleye regulation that uh, uh, I think a, a lot of anglers maybe wouldn't have a, a, an issue with. Uh, but I guess just to back up for a second, our, our regulation philosophy in North Dakota is that we'll certainly consider a regulation change uh, or more restrictive regulation if it's going to lead to a, a healthier uh, walleye population from a biological perspective or a healthy any kind of fish population from a from biological perspective. And then secondly, we considered if it might lead to you know some benefits from a social perspective. Like it, it might, for example, lead to anglers being able to catch more bigger fish or having more bigger fish out there in the population. And so that's something I spend an awful lot of time uh, looking at through our creel surveys and our population surveys that we do is uh, would there be a benefit to something like a 1 over 20 inch regulation. And uh, so far, I guess kind of the proof is in the pudding. We're maintaining a very healthy walleye population right now in the absence of uh, more restrictive regulations. And uh, you know, those, if we put more restrictive regulations in place, uh, sometimes that can act as a barrier between you know, people and fishing. 
uh, no one wants to feel like they need to have their, their lawyer with them when they're out fishing, right. you know, to interpret our regulations. So we'd like to keep them as simple as possible, but keeping that in mind, we want healthy fish populations out there, and we don't want to impact the ability of anglers to, you know, maybe, you know, have the best fishing out there uh, as possible. But uh, with this, the creel survey we conducted last year, uh, we interviewed over 1,200 anglers uh, fishing between Garrison Dam and the North Dakota-South Dakota border. And we measured the fish that an awful lot of those anglers caught. If we would have had a 1 over 20 inch regulation in place last year, that would have required the releasing of about 14 fish over 20 inches amongst those 1,200 anglers. So we right now have no evidence to say that anglers uh, under our present regulations are impacting the ability of the Missouri River and Lake Oahe to produce uh, good numbers of fish over 20 inches. And again, I think the, the kind of the proof is in the pudding there. We, you know, recently we broke the state record walleye uh, last year on the Missouri River. Uh, in our sampling, we're consistently seeing uh, some trophy size walleye out there. So that's one of those, it isn't broke right now, so uh, we certainly don't want to fix it. Something that comes up every spring too, Paul, is, is anglers, some anglers think that keeping some of these big female fish with eggs is bad for the fisheries. Uh, I, I mean, that, again, a, a legitimate concern on a place like the Missouri River and Lake Oahe where we are relying on natural reproduction to maintain that, that fishery. But uh, if you think about a walleye's reproductive strategy, uh, it, they typically lay way more eggs than are ever necessary to maintain that fish population. Uh, we're, you know, each female walleye may lay 150,000 or more eggs. So the, the reproductive potential on the Missouri River and Lake Oahe is billions and billions of eggs every spring. And uh, again, that just fits into the walleye's reproductive strategy where they tend to lay more eggs than are ever needed to maintain that population. And environmental factors indicate when, or dictate when we have a good year of reproductive success or a strong year class formed. So uh, when we have stable to rising water levels, uh, mild springtime weather that doesn't have these big temperature swings or high wind events that can damage eggs, and then following that we get good zooplankton production, which is what those newly hatched walleye need to feed on after they're hatched, we're going to have a strong year class formed, uh, despite how many eggs might have been laid. So, uh, no, there's, there's no indication that, uh, again, anglers are having a, a negative impact on the ability of this walleye population to maintain itself through natural reproduction. Let's move on to northern pike in Lake Oahe, Paul. How are populations? Uh, good. Uh, uh, pike numbers, I wouldn't say, are as high as they were just a few years ago, but uh, honestly, the trophy potential is uh, pretty spectacular out there right now. Uh, Lake Oahe has always been known as a place to uh, potentially target a 20 plus pound pike, but uh, in more recent years here, I don't know if there's a better place in the, the lower 48 here to maybe target one of those truly giant fish out there, maybe a pike of 25 plus pounds. Uh, we do see those uh, pretty consistently unbelievable, as it may sound, in, in the spring in our netting operations. Paul, let's talk about crappies in Lake Oahe. It's been a, a pleasant experience for a lot of anglers over the last few years that Lake Oahe has produced some pretty extraordinary crappie fishing. And that really stems from when the, the high water returned in 2009. So that's kind of what anglers have been mining on the last few years, of these, this really strong 2009 year class of crappie in Lake Oahe. So they're out there, they keep getting a little bit bigger, but I think anglers have noticed too, their numbers are, are declining a bit. But uh, that it's still produced pretty good crappie fishing again this year, and we've got our fingers crossed that these, these fish will definitely stay around for a few more years. Let's talk catfish. Yeah, and that, honestly, channel catfish in Lake Oahe may be the single most underutilized fishery in North Dakota. It's the, we've got more catfish than walleye in Lake Oahe. They're extremely abundant out there. Uh, we'd love to see anglers maybe tapping into that resource a little bit better. And one of the neat things about those catfish, too, is they're so vulnerable from shore. Uh, you know, it's at, you know, certain times of the year, maybe walleye uh, aren't as easy to catch from shore. Uh, catfish really offer great shore fishing opportunity. And, you know, even from a boat too. But, uh, and then another neat thing about the catfish too is they, they will oftentimes cooperate best for anglers in July and August when maybe other fishing opportunities aren't quite as good. So certainly something to consider is maybe try targeting catfish on Lake Oahe. Okay, let's move into your walleye populations in your district lakes, Paul. That's definitely the bright spot. I think honestly in South Central North Dakota, our, our walleye fishing has probably never been better. Uh, we've never had better opportunity out there than we do right now. We've got a lot of these mature fisheries out there, you know, places like Alkaline Lake, Josephine, Jasper, uh, Dry Lake, Rice Lake, uh, pretty noteworthy fisheries that should produce well for anglers again in the upcoming year. And then we've got a lot of new fisheries hopefully coming online too. Unfortunately, some of those are going to be the ones that were more impacted uh, through the threat of winter kill this year, but we're hoping enough of them make it through that there'll still be some, some new places popping up that anglers can take advantage of. How about Northern Pike? 
Uh, I'd say northern pike are more kind of holding their own to maybe even declining a bit. Uh, the you know some we've still got good pike fishing opportunity out there. Places like Helen, uh, West Lake Napoleon uh, are certainly some of our more noteworthy uh, pike fisheries. Uh, uh, Harriet Arena Lake has been popular with ice anglers, especially the last few years. So there's still good opportunity out there, but uh, these declining water levels have certainly impacted a number of our pike populations as well. Okay. How about panfish? That's where I think we're, uh, when it comes to perch especially, uh, they're definitely a boomer bust fishery in North Dakota. So when we had those consistently rising water levels following the springs of 9, 10, and 11, uh, that really led to another boom in our perch, our perch fishing. As our lake levels kind of stabilized and started declining, our, our perch populations have definitely kind of gone the wrong way. So I'd say uh, we've still got good opportunity out there in a few places, but uh, anglers should definitely temper their expectations a bit that you know catching a, an easy 20 perch limit isn't going to be as, as easy as it was a few years ago when the options are a little more limited for doing that. But the size structure of perch out there is pretty darn good in a lot of places. I think there's still good opportunity in a lot of these lakes for those 12 plus inch perch it's just going to be harder to catch 20 of them for sure. Any other panfish or any other species we should be talking about, Paul? Uh, yeah, bluegill opportunity. There's still, it's not as good maybe in the south central part of the state as it is uh, maybe in particular in the southwestern part of the state. But uh, places like Crown Butte Dam, Harmon Lake, uh, Freilick Dam doesn't have great numbers of uh, bluegill, but what's out there is pretty nice size. You can say the same thing about Fredham Lake too. Uh, Maybe not uh, extremely abundant bluegill up there, but there's you know the potential of some nine plus inch bluegill in some of these lakes. Paul, you manage a lot of lakes in South Central North Dakota. You guys just finished your dissolved oxygen testing. What'd you find? Well, we, we found a lot of things to be concerned about. I guess this year uh, with the uh, the severe winter we had, especially from February on, uh, and the amount of snowfall out there. Uh, one of the bad things that kind of happened this year was winter did set in early. Uh, you know, around Thanksgiving we had that cold snap, so a lot of these lakes did ice over. We had a really mild December uh, into early January, and then, uh, you know, Mother Nature showed us what she can do in the winters here in North Dakota, and, it's, uh, and that certainly has increased the threat of winter kill happening on, on many of our lakes. If a lake does winter kill, what are the next steps? Well, that's, why, I guess, why we monitor it so closely. In, in mid-February is typically when we do our dissolved oxygen testing. Uh, it's usually one of the where we kind of hit a low point in dissolved oxygen levels uh, every winter. And that does give us time to, to plan how we're going to utilize our hatchery resources uh, for the following year to make sure, you know, some of these more, a lake that looks like it's you know, going to have good potential to overwinter fish the next year, uh, that we can get some hatchery fish in there, especially to uh, kind of jumpstart that population as quickly as possible. What are some of the signs that would show of a lake that winter killed? Uh, one of the most obvious signs is probably something you're going to notice with your nose, and that's this hydrogen sulfide gas that's produced uh, when these lakes go anoxic or run out of oxygen. So there's still going to be some decomposition of organic matter happening even in the absence of oxygen. And one of the byproducts of that is that hydrogen sulfide gas, which is basically that rotten egg smell. So if you poke a hole in the ice and you smell that hydrogen sulfide gas, that's obviously a, a very good sign that a, a fish kill occurred. So the best thing to do is contact the game of fish. You guys obviously cannot get to every single lake in your district. Yeah, we, we sample an awful lot of them every winter, but uh, and one of the bigger issues I think this winter especially is we've got a, a number of lakes where we've documented winter kills have occurred already. And uh, you know where we did smell that hydrogen sulfide gas or measured very low dissolved oxygen levels. But I've got another very long list of lakes, unfortunately, that are, are, that are lakes that could kind of go either way at this time. Uh, when we sample dissolved oxygen levels in, say, mid-February, they're a lot lower than we like to see them, but we didn't necessarily see a fish kill yet. But we might not see ice off happening until mid-April this year. So that's potentially two more months of, of ice coverage that these lakes could still experience a winter kill. That, uh, we'd like to be aware of that, so when anglers are, are you know, still fishing uh, late ice here, or you know, as the ice is coming off these lakes, if anglers notice uh, any dead fish, uh, let us know. That would be valuable information to us. Yeah, it gives you time to prepare for the next steps. Absolutely, yep. Last year, as far as water levels, they were going down. All this snow going to help? Well, if it's a double-edged sword, yeah. The, all the snow on the ground uh, in these severe winters greatly increase, increase the threat of winter kill occurring. But if we if we get some runoff this spring, uh, that'll hopefully recharge some of these lakes that are, are really in need of it right now. Uh, a lot of these lakes are certainly going the wrong way. They're down, in some cases, four or five feet from uh, the highs they hit, say, in the spring of uh, 2011. So we're definitely losing water. Uh, some of these fisheries, kind of the writing was on the wall that uh, they weren't going to be here long term without another shot of water. So uh, if there's a positive to all this snow, 
Uh, let's hope we get some runoff this spring to, to definitely refill some of these lakes. A lot of good information, Paul. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. For more information on fishing in North Dakota, go to the Game and Fish website at gf.nd.gov or pick up a 2018 to 2020 North Dakota Fishing Guide. For South Central District Supervisor Paul Bailey and the rest of the staff here at the Game and Fish Department, thanks for joining us for this week's Outdoors Online. We'll see you again next week.